if you really want to understand America's obsession today with um, orgasms without responsibility, we have to deal with contraception, right? And I know this is this is uncomfortable for a lot of evangelicals, right? Of which I count myself one, because a lot of Protestants, you know this, Josh, they want they like their birth control. <laughs> I mean, like they don't they don't want to have ten children. They want to be able to decide that. Welcome to The Great Awakening. I'm your host, Josh Dawes. My guest today is the author of a new book and the producer of a documentary, both about the history of Planned Parenthood and its founder, Margaret Sanger. My guest is Seth Gruber. He is a pro-life activist and speaker that you may have seen at uh, Turning Point USA. He is um, a regular contributor at Clear Truth Media, where I have gotten to know his work over the last few months. He's a super smart guy that knows this subject backwards and forwards. Uh, this is a great conversation. I watched the documentary last week. Very uh, interesting um, and just kind of alarming, you know, seeing how Margaret Sanger was able to push her wicked worldview into all of the institutions of our modern society. And so it's a, it's a fascinating uh, documentary. It's a fascinating conversation uh, with Seth. I think you're really going to enjoy it. But before we jump into that, I would love to tell you about a sponsor for this week's episode, Sherwood Kids. If you're anything like me, you struggle to find good books and shows to enjoy with your kids. Everything that is being produced is designed to be high stimulation and keep kids glued to a screen, not Sherwood Kids. Big media is not only pushing their agendas on our kids, they are designing shows to be as addictive as possible. That's why I'm thrilled about Sherwood Kids, a new low stimulation platform that helps kids develop a love for reading and maintain their ability to enjoy life without a dependency on screens. It is specifically designed to entertain kids for short periods of time, but to then but to then get them off the screen and to be active with their minds. It is perfect for those times of day when you may allow your kids to have a little bit of screen time, maybe when you're preparing dinner. The, the key is that Sherwood Kids won't cause the same kind of reactions you can get from kids when you take the iPad, iPad away or turn off the TV. With thousands of wholesome audiobooks, ebooks, and read along videos, Sherwood is home to the kind of stories we want shaping our kids. And they are doing so in a way that actually strengthens their imagination. You can be sure there isn't any hidden, woke, subversive messaging in the content your kids are getting. If you don't want your kids mindlessly watching shows and being discontent without a screen, then discover a better way at SherwoodKids.com and use code DAWS for half off lifetime subscriptions. Sherwood Kids is about to launch, and you can get in early and get half off a lifetime membership when you use the code DAWS at checkout. All right, so let's jump right into my conversation with Seth. Hey, Seth, thanks for joining me. Thanks, brother. It's good to finally hang with you, man. Been loving your commentary and thoughts in the uh, uh, social media space, and uh, we need more voices like you, so it's good to hang. Well, thank you, man. I, I appreciated uh, what I've seen from you as well. Um, like I was telling you before, uh, your appearance on Ali Stuckey's show was just phenomenal. So definitely uh, recommend that to people. Um, yeah, but thank you. You are, uh, you've written a book and have uh, produced a documentary by the same name uh, called The 1916 Project, uh, yeah, obviously right. taking a cue from The New York Times and uh, Hannah <laughs> Nicole yeah. Jones' uh, 1619 Project. Yeah. Um, right. What is... Uh, why, what is significant about the year 1916, uh, and, and why did you make, uh, you know, start this project? Yeah, yeah. So 1916 is when Margaret Sanger, the founder of Planned Parenthood, opened her first clinic in the Brownsville neighborhood of Brooklyn, New York, um, an area heavily populated by those she defined as unfit to reproduce, <laughs> um, black Slavs, Italians, Jews. Uh, and the mentally and physically disabled, okay? Um, obviously, she didn't open her first clinic in Greenwich Village, where she lived with all of her rich white friends. 
um, it was in a poverty stricken uh, community, largely comprised of immigrants. That really becomes, Josh, the first Planned Parenthood clinic. Okay. That's the beginning of the best funded 501c3 <clears throat> in human history, <laughs> the largest abortion provider in the world, the largest provider of the pornographic comprehensive sexuality education in America's public schools. And as of last year, <clears throat> Planned Parenthood announced they're now the second largest provider of puberty blockers and cross-sex hormones for America's gender-confused youth. And Josh, with the overturning of Roe v. Wade, guess what? Because a lot of their brick-and-mortar clinics can no longer operate in more red states, trans drugs for teens is now Planned Parenthood's fastest-growing revenue stream. Okay? So there you go. That's Planned Parenthood. It was founded in 1921, but, but its founder opened her very first clinic as the beginning of her global demonic revolution in 1916. And my contention is that that date and that woman, more evil has come from that date and that woman than any other date or any other human being in the 20th century in terms of um, its impact or let's say fingerprints on 2024. On yeah. today's insane, stupid, upside down culture. And yes, I'm including Kinsey and Hugh Hefner in that. I, I don't even think they could have been who they were without Sanger. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, and so, uh, and then there's a hilarious story about how the 1619 Project <laughs> with the New York Times that says everything is racist, everything. And if you say maybe not everything's racist, that's proof of your racism. Mm -hmm. um, there's a hilarious story about it, the 1619 Project, Josh, and its disciples leading into the summer of love or the mostly peaceful, somewhat fiery summer of 2020 led to Planned Parenthood canceling their own founder uh, because the revolution always eats its own. So that's the uh, opener. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, it, uh, like you said, it, we're pretty much living in the world that Margaret Sanger created. Yeah. How did how was she so? successful at, at, at like can you can you walk us through like kind of what the beginnings were what she was trying to do and how she managed to to create an organization that is so successful and, and whose ideology has really infiltrated and, and taken over every major institution in the west well i mean she was relentless right josh i mean that's the first thing you have to realize <clears throat> um as the church not realizes yet since 2020 the left is far more dogmatic and zealous for their religion in the public square <laughs> than most Christians are for pure and undefiled religion. Um, we, we, we are not anywhere near as passionate about what we believe um, in the church as the high priests of humanism and the architects of the culture of death are for their religion and their ideology. <laughs> this should be pretty self-evident by now. So that's the first thing to remember, unfortunately, is that the left seems to just care a lot more about religion than we do. Of course, it's it's a demonic, false religion. It's very dangerous, but it's still religion. It's just super mm -hmm. deadly. Um, and then Margaret Sanger um, was wasn't necessarily like uh, following um, trailblazers. She was blazing a path a path where none existed. It's very important to understand that she was one of the first like open advocates for the joys of the flesh. Um, if you want to, if you want to talk about a mother of the sexual revolution, okay, it would be Margaret Sanger. Like she, uh, um, Mabel Dodge, uh, owned an apartment in Greenwich village in 19, uh, 10, 1912, 1914. And, uh, they would have these gatherings, uh, and they would talk about sex and they would talk about a revolution and they would talk about how evil the church was. And they would, uh, talk about what has become, the phrase today, Josh, the long walk through the institutions, um, right? And Margaret Sang would be at these gatherings. And I've read some of the writings of people who were in the room uh, back over like 110 years ago, bro. Uh, and one woman said that Margaret Sanger was the first woman that, this, that they ever knew who was an open evangelist for the joys of the flesh. Um, and they said this was super taboo back then. That was, you know, I mean, this is like the early 1900s. Uh, and so what you have to understand about Margaret Sanger is that she was a trailblazer in every sense of the word, and she was relentless. Um, she had multiple adulterous affairs um, when she broke New York state law um, for uh, breaking the Comstock laws, which are anti-obscenity laws. 
which by the way, we still have anti-obscenity laws on the books in America. Many of them, they're just never enforced anymore. <laughs> Very mm -hmm. sad. And so rather than get arrested, Josh, <laughs> Margaret Sanger shipped her kids off to be raised by friends, had her socialist friends in the New York labor movement forge her a passport, and she fled to England. Uh, and for 18 months, she was in England, sleeping her way up the levers of power. Um, H.G. Wells, Havelock Ellis, um, this French dude, uh, many others. Havelock Ellis was really um, the Alfred Kinsey of England, by the way. Um, he wrote over 100 books on every weird form of sexual experimentation. Um, Havelock Ellis was himself impotent, so he was always trying to find new ways to get excited. Um, well, guess who uh, Havelock Ellis was mentored by? Francis Galton, the guy who coined the term eugenics. Mm. <laughs> so we were we're literally one figure away, bro, from the guy who is the father of the eugenics movement and coined the stinking term with his protege in the middle, Havelock Ellis, who Margaret Sanger said Havelock Ellis was her number one political and sexual influence. They remained pen pals wow. for years. And guess who Francis Galton got his ideas from? Uh, oh, that's right. His cousin, Charles Darwin. Huh. So we literally went within four people, bro. From this is how secular discipleship, by the way, works, Josh, right? Uh, yeah. Darwin, man is an animal. Y'all came from monkeys, so there's no image of God. His cousin reads his book, Francis Galton, goes, This is inspirational. The way that we obtain the survival of the fittest that my cousin was writing about is by eliminating the unfit. Welcome to eugenics. Galton then mentors Havelock Ellis, who hosts his orgies in his home and becomes the number one political and sexual mentor to a woman named Margaret Sanger. So we, we moved awfully quickly from man is an animal to uh, obliterate the unfit to sexual chaos to uh, child sacrifice at an organization that kills 33 percent of America's unborn babies every 12 months. So that's a little bit of the background behind Margaret Sanger. She knew how to wine and dine people, Josh. She wined and dined people on both sides of the political aisle. This is shocking and difficult for some people to hear, but co alleged conservatives uh, and Republicans were funding what became Planned Parenthood. Margaret Sanger was brilliant at getting people to support her. Um, and uh, I guess the last thing to say would be that um, M Margaret Sanger had... Um, I had to be kicked off the board multiple times because she was a raging alcoholic um, having multiple affairs and she was so toxic for the organization, but they couldn't survive without her. So Planned Parent had to keep bringing her back in. Uh, this woman had a relentless demonic vision. Um, and I think it's important for the church to be able to, uh, I'll actually label that as such. Like we're dealing with doctrines of demons. Yeah. Like, like Satan wants human beings. He wants to dominate them. He wants to fill them. He wants to use them. And I, I think probably Satan found one of his most successful revolutionaries in the 20th century in, in Margaret Sanger. Um, she also was expert at, uh, at um, poking, uh, putting a foot in the door where there was an opportunity and blowing the door open. So um, remember the fundamentalist modernist crisis, right, mm -hmm. of the 30s. So the fundamentalists are like, oh, my gosh, people are going woke. And so basically, they all became um, Tim Keller's. Sorry, uh, we're going to go there. So, oh, we, we got to protect the orthodoxy of the scriptures. We have to protect the integrity of, of the word of God. And so the fundamentalists are left with their literal interpretation of the Bible and, and, and trying to protect it from, you know, political and philosophical uh, defilement. And so we're just going to preach the Bible. Just preach the gospel. This leads into the whole, just preach the gospel. Johnson Amendment, separation to church and state. And then, of course, you get the modernists, which is now like, you know, Jim Wallace and Sojourners. I mean, just woke, full-blown idiots who are not Christians anymore. Sanger was really good at um, taking advantage of that divide and getting massive uh, Christian, quote unquote, support from the religious liberals for the birth control movement that she was building, which, of course, eventually became the abortion movement mm. and abortion on demand as we know it today. So that was probably more than you wanted to hear, but that's kind of uh, a little bit of the background on <laughs> what led into our culture of death today. Yeah. It, it strikes me that like, I don't know. I, I feel like the, they try and come up with euphemisms of reproductive care and, and things today that kind of, I don't know, mask the brutal reality of what, what it is that they do. 
That's and right. it, it seems like in her early writing, I, I mean, she writes about the Negro project that where yeah. she wants to eliminate black people because she sees them as unfit. Like, how did how did she go from, you know, just being out in the open with these radical eugenic ideas to becoming this thing that your average, respectable, middle class, you know, suburban mom support? Yeah, Sanger was very politically astute. Josh, um, she measured what she would say. <laughs> she was very good at, um, I, I guess, I guess a little bit. Well, I guess a little bit better than Kamala Harris, but licking her finger and sticking it up and seeing which way the wind's blowing. Um, you see those funny clips recently, Josh, of Kamala Harris versus Kamala Harris. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> just changing her political position. Saying it was a little bit better than that, but she knew how to measure uh, the culture and kind of what what our culture in america was was ready for or willing to accept um but from very early on like and, for, and behind me in my book you see i've got like some of margaret the first editions of some of margaret sanger's books <clears throat> and dude to read it is so shocking uh, but most most people conservatives and liberals right aren't going to actually go and read sanger's writing her books they're not actually going to go to the archives you can find online of the birth control review which was her magazine dude uh, which I think she launched uh, in 1917, if I'm remembering correctly. That's right, right after her first clinic. And for 30 years, this guided her ideological um, sort of formation and direction. And she, it, she, I mean, there were, dude, there were people in the Third Reich that were guest writers in her magazine. Okay, like <laughs> all, all of the American Eugenic Society, by the way, um, was mostly writing for her magazine. And so you go read it, and this is this is before 1921, which is when the official organization, the American Birth Control League, is formed. And you're like, oh my gosh, you know, she believed this stuff all along. Okay, so mm -hmm. the, the the libs have done a really good job over the over the century, actually, Josh, at curating and managing Sanger's legacy because they have to because they gave Hillary Clinton the Margaret Sanger Award, they gave Nancy Pelosi the Margaret Sanger Award. I mean, like there was a bust of Sanger's face at the Smithsonian. OK, and over the years, when you study and read the biographies and writings and coverage of Margaret Sanger, you can notice how the left has adjusted and sort of edited out of their coverage of Sanger, the more disturbing aspects of who Sanger was, which more Americans did know 100 years ago. And, and so I, I, what we're doing with the 1916 Project, Josh, is, is we're saying, hey, this is not necessarily a forgotten history. It's a hidden history. Mm -hmm. And if you have never heard any of these shocking things before Americans and Christians, that's OK. It's because it's been hidden from you. OK. Uh, and so here's how Margaret Sanger defined birth control. She said more children from the fit, less from the unfit. That is the chief issue of birth control, end quote. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so in the church today, when we're like, oh, birth control, it's like I just want to like sometimes like shake the church. Josh would be like. Hey, just really quick. Um, do you know who coined the term birth <laughs> control? <laughs> it was Margaret Sanger coined the term birth control. And she didn't mean helping poor black and brown women plan their parenthood, Josh. Birth control for Sanger meant controlling the birth <laughs> of individuals. Some people I'm okay with having born. Mm -hmm. Some people I don't really want to let them have kids. I don't know if you know this, Josh, but Sanger called for sterilization and segregation camps for those that the political elites deemed unfit to reproduce. Literally put them in camps. Oh, wait, I, is this going somewhere that I've heard about that before? <laughs> like, dude, that's in her writings, bro. And then she said, birth control is not contraception thoughtlessly and indiscriminately practiced. Sanger said, birth control means the cultivation and release of the better racial elements in our society and the gradual suppression, elimination, and eventual extinction of defective stocks of those human weeds, which threaten the blossoming of the finest flowers of American civilization, end quote. So if you want to know how Sanger defined birth control, there you go. It's really important for believers to understand that if you want to understand today's culture of death, today's insane obsession with, I'm going to say it, orgasms without responsibility, 
um, that hey, if it feels good, do it. Hey, I just want to do what I want to do. Hey, by the way, this, this I've coined that term sort of like, or sort of orgasms about responsibility. But but say you're basically said that Josh in her first magazine, Woman Rebel. <laughs> there you go. Woman <laughs> Rebel, which, by the way, bore the tagline, no gods and no masters. <laughs> uh, she said this. Our ultimate objective is unlimited sexual gratification without the burden of unwanted children, end quote. So that was before she founded Planned Parenthood. That was her first magazine. Well, how, how can we paraphrase that? Orgasms without responsibility. So if you, if you want to understand kind of today's sexual revolution in the 21st century, uh, where we, we don't know what a man or a woman is, um, we're, we're surgically castrating the genitals of minors um, who believe they're the other gender and our tax dollars are paying for it. If you want to understand, like, um, uh, oh, how about labeling parents who speak at school board meetings because they don't like Planned Parenthood's porn, porn sex ed in the schools, which teaches that children have a right to orgasms without responsibility, labeling those parents as domestic terrorists um, because Merrick Garland was too busy arresting dads uh, and looking into them than he was, I don't know, like with BLM 2020 uh, and people burning down pregnancy centers. If you want to understand all that, you have to realize that this did not just begin with abortion. OK, you don't just go like, let's kill babies. OK, like the, the, the cultural soil from which killing babies could emerge has to already have been infected for some time. You can't deal with abortion in an isolated little box. Uh, Francis Schaefer used to say things like this, Josh, right? He used to say, like, the church tends to deal in bits and pieces rather than dealing in totalities mm -hmm. with the culture, because there's an underlying worldview that animates our culture of death today. And if we can master that worldview, if we can be the sons of Issachar, Josh, men who understood the times, and so they knew what Israel ought to do, then we're going to be more effective at standing for the full counsel of God at discipling the next generation, right? And so to, to really understand today's culture, you can't just go back to uh, abortion, 1973, Roe v. Wade, oh my gosh, because even Margaret Sanger, Josh, was not launching the American Birth Control League in 1921 to do abortions. Bro, that didn't start happening until the late 60s or early 70s. Now, in my book, if you guys get my book, The 1960 Project, uh, the subtitle is The Lying, the Witch, and the War We're In, um, you'll find some of Margaret Sanger's pro-abortion rhetoric, by the way. So I do believe that that was where she was like wanting to go. Mm -hmm. But in those early years, it was about contraception, birth control as a way to limit birth. And so if you really want to understand America's obsession today with um, orgasms without responsibility, we have to deal with contraception, right? And I know this is, this is uncomfortable for a lot of evangelicals, right, of which I count myself one, because a lot of Protestants, you know this, Josh, they, want, they like their birth control, <laughs> I mean, like they don't they don't want to have 10 children. They want to be able to decide that. Now, I'm listen, I'm not an open womb theorist, you know, the, the like open womb theory of like women should have as many children as biologically possible. I'm not that I'm not saying that, but I'm saying like maybe God like actually wants to like say something. Maybe he wants to communicate something like maybe he has a plan for how many children you should have. Um, and, and, but we're we're so used to birth control in the church of like literally planning our parenthood. Mm -hmm. um, that I think we've forgotten that that might be one of the puzzle pieces of today's cultural decay. I know this podcast is going to give me a trouble, but, but listen, uh, God says, behold, it is good. Be fruitful and multiply, uh, exercise dominion, fill the earth and subdue it. Um, when, when we say we have to practice stewardship, Josh, on our finances, on our family, on our, on our wealth, on our friendships, on our connections, on our business on our fertility. Oh, no, not fertility. No, 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 no. You don't have to exercise stewardship on that. You get to tell God how many children you're going to have. It's like, wait, wait a second. I thought we were supposed to exercise stewardship at all things. It's a weird thing. And yeah. Protestants don't like to go the direction I'm, I'm taking this conversation right now, because they want to plan their parenthood. I'm saying, I'm simply saying, where did those ideas begin? Where did the ideas of actually, we should be able to use, <clears throat> um, new modern forms of uh, medicine to tell God um, how many children we're going to have. Uh, well, that came from Margaret Sanger. The, the, the phrase birth control was coined by Margaret Sanger. And so like, if you want to be like, whoa, an LGBTQ agenda that denies the difference of men and women. Oh, that's crazy. Well, well, how was that enshrined? 
well, I don't know, maybe the redefinition of marriage, Josh, which was a decision from the Supreme Court, right? Oh, okay, well, let's keep going. How, how do we really trace this cultural decay? Well, I guess the premise that men and women are exactly the same and are indiscernible and can substitute one for the other. Well, I guess that came from, well, I, I guess feminism, um, which says women and, and men are pretty much the same, uh, right? What, what, what did that feminist say? Women need a man like a fish needs a bicycle. Okay, so, so, okay, so was it the redefinition of marriage? Okay, so that was feminism. Well, where, where does the sexual revolution come from? What was the single event that upended sexual mores and behaviors in the United States? It was the advent of contraception. <laughs> and not just the advent of contraception as a scientific discovery. There, there's always been more technological means, right? Like some more effective, some less effective for putting off conceiving. That's been true for all of history, uh, right? But the big change was not a technological discovery of birth control. The big change was a cultural mainstreaming of and legal enshrining of a license to birth control in the Constitution. Margaret Sanger managed to maximize and take advantage of that and really put the culture of death on steroids today. So yeah. I, that's, what, that's what, deeper than I've usually gone. And I know I'm, I'm on a soapbox and I should probably shut up, Josh. But for believers to understand, if we're going to deal in totalities with how we got here, you've got to go all the way back to birth control, a phrase coined by Margaret Sanger and defined as a way to limit the birth of human weeds and defective stocks. The birth control movement in the early 1900s was the same thing as the eugenics movement. Yeah, I, I think that's totally, totally correct. Um, and that it's those underlying ideas, that worldview that she initiated. The church wants to focus, you know, if it's focusing it at all on anything, it's focusing on abortion. And right. it's neglecting those those underlying issues that led to that, because even, you know, if if she was just focused on contraceptives early on, establishing that right to I should be able to have consequence consequence free sex, then that. Just by, you know, logical progression leads to establishing that as a as a a right and that abortion is the backstop if the contraceptive fails. It's like because yep. we have to guarantee this right that we've already established that women have, then we have to legalize abortion because it that's, you know, she has the freedom not to have to, you know, endure a pregnancy like that. Yep. Yeah. Yep, it's interesting. Right. I'll, I'll spin this in an even weirder direction. <laughs> the <laughs> the uh, best argument I ever heard for um, uh, against contraception uh, actually, believe it or not, came from Stephen King. In his book, uh, The Stand, <laughs> it's wild. I was reading the first time I read this. I could not believe I got to this this passage. There's a character, uh, Mother Abigail, in that that is uh, a Christian character. And as much as Stephen King hates Christians, he sure knows how to write a good Christian character. <laughs> and and this she she kind of goes on a rant about you know kids today. And uh, and she she says, um, I wish I had the quote in front of me, but she says something about birth control that. We have given up the ultimate, like, like sex, you know, a sexual relationship is the ultimate act of trusting God. Because we know that going into that, that it could result in a baby. Yeah, that's and, and by taking that, that act, you know, by making it safe, you know, you're taking away that, that aspect of trusting God. And I think that is, that's missing in so many Christian marriages. That yep. this is an act of worship that's saying, God, we trust you. We're going right. to show our love, you know, together. Um, that's a good point. In a way that, that is also showing our trust in you. And it, 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 it you know, we've, we've robbed that aspect of the marital relationship, I think, in the church. Well, uh, yeah. And the, the, the mainstreaming and legal enshrining of birth control, Josh convinced Americans, this, this, listen, this is very important, that if you consent to sex, that doesn't mean that you consent to pregnancy. What is one of the most popular pro-abortion phrases and arguments in the culture? Well, let me tell you, I go to college campuses, Josh, and so I can tell you the things that young women scream at me. Consent to sex is not consent to pregnancy. Dude, that's one of the most popular pro-abortion talking points and phrases on the left and in the culture today. Consent to sex is not consent to pregnancy, to which I always say, by the way, I say, then consent to eating Krispy Kreme donuts for every meal for five years is not consent to obesity. <laughs> 
And I had a young woman at, I think it was San Diego State University, look at me like eyes glazed over. Like, like what? Wow. And then she said, she was hilarious. She went, okay, Seth, consent to sex is not consent to pregnancy. But consent to sex is consent to the possibility of pregnancy. <laughs> to which I said, that's the same thing, ma'am. <laughs> um, and, and so that is what birth control did to the American mind. That's what it did. That, that I, well, hey, I'm, I'm, I'm going to have sex with you, but, but hey, I'm not, I'm not consenting to, to pregnancy because <laughs> right. we're using a condom or I'm using a, you know, uh, whatever, <laughs> IUD, I don't, whatever. And so I'm not consenting to pregnancy. Yes, you are. Okay, you, you can't rip sex from its procreative telos. Mm -hmm. And so what did birth control do to the American consciousness? It put the culture of death on steroids because now we have the right to orgasms without responsibility. So if you consent to sex, but you're on birth control, then you're thinking, I have not consented to or agreed to have a baby. So there's already a dehumanizing logic operative in that coitus. <laughs> so if that girl, wife or not, gets pregnant, oh, what the heck? I didn't consent to this baby. I, I told you to use, did you use protection? I, we can't do this. I didn't consent to this. So now you're already thinking that you've been gypped. That you're mm -hmm. already thinking that you've been denied something or that you've been forced to deal with something that you assumed a priori was something that you shouldn't or don't have to deal with. So <laughs> how much more likely is a couple like that, Josh, to then go kill the baby? Mm -hmm. A lot more likely, I would say. Yeah. So let's give the Catholics a win on this front. They have done better at trying to warn the West about the dehumanizing aspect of birth control in the American consciousness. Yeah, agreed. That leads us eventually to the abortion industry, to the abortion movement. What was the seed of that, though? The seed of that was the American Birth Control League, founded in 1921 by Margaret Sanger. Let me say it again. Who coined the stinking term, Christians, <laughs> birth control. That phrase did not exist until Margaret Th Sanger thought it up. Anyway. All right. Let's talk about the church. Because uh, yeah. it seems to me that the church was kind of humming along um, under Roe v. Wade. We, none of us, I think, really believed that it would be you know, overturned in our lifetime. And right. then along comes this guy that most of us held our nose to vote for. Right. Uh, and he, he delivers you know, a Supreme Court that overturns this way ahead of schedule. And I, I, I feel like the pro-life movement has been kind of caught off guard, unprepared for a post-Dobbs world. Oh, absolutely. Um, yeah. And now churches are, I think, kind of struggling because it was like, I feel like churches uh, glommed on to crisis pregnancy centers, which do great work. I'm a big fan of crisis pregnancy totally. centers. But I feel like that uh, because Roe v. Wade was out of our hands, you know, there's nothing we can do about that. I feel like it kind of gave us a, a neat little checkbox to check. Like, yep, we, we send money to the crisis pregnancy center. We do oh, a once a year drive. Yeah. That's right. And now we're in this world where this is a state by state battle and you're seeing churches missing in action. Like what is what is going on? Like the, yeah. what happened in Ohio and the fight in Florida, I'm hearing reports of churches that are just not saying anything. They're not taking a stand because we don't want to get political. Yeah. That's Help right. us. You know what? How should the church be responding in a post Dobbs world? Yeah, I mean, we share so many of the same frustrations, Josh, and that's why, uh, you know, we're sometimes uh, responding to the same stuff on on X <laughs> on Twitter. Um, l listen, I, I believe I believe that unless the church flatulent becomes the church militant, it will become the church irrelevant. Um, and by militant, I don't mean like, go grab your AR-15 right now. Um, that's not what I mean. I mean, like militant in righteousness, militant in fervor for your king and for and for standing against wickedness and actually defeating this deadly global agenda that wants to wipe out the image of God from the earth. Um, I, I like it how Herbert Schlossberg said, he said, a church that is not iconoclastic is a travesty. 
if it is not against the idols, it is with them. Mm. Um, and so how much more so is that statement true, Josh, when now every state has full autonomy and freedom to ban and criminalize abortion at the state level? Now that fight has gotten smaller and more local to where you live, pastor, Christian. So no more of this, well, I disagree with Roe v. Wade, but the Supreme Court has spoken and we don't want to have a civil war. So what can I do as a pastor or as a Christian beyond supporting the Pregnancy Resource Center when like we can't, we're not allowed to ban abortion at the state level because of Roe v. Wade, the, the court has spoken. Well, that's not true anymore. Now it's back to the states. So find some testicular fortitude, pastor. Stand up, equip the saints to fulfill the work of the ministry. Mobilize the bride of Christ to stand against the idols, to, to tear them down, to protect the babies. Because the longer you tolerate wickedness, idolatry, and evil, guess what happens, Josh? It corrupts and destroys all of your society. You think that they'll just kill babies? As, by, by the way, as if that's not evil enough to awaken the moral and spiritual consciousness of the church and pastors. Like the mm. fact that like that's not wicked enough, that's not in your face enough, that's not blatant enough, that's not so obviously demonic enough for you to contend against. Like, they, like what else do you need? Like, unfortunately, that, that's, that's true in the church, Josh. Unfortunately, many pastors did not stand until they were told they had to shut their church. Mm -hmm. You and I know a lot of men, don't we, who, who would say they, they, they found their courage in 2020. Mm -hmm. who, who they I mean I've had multiple pastors tell me that at least that like that that they weren't they weren't woke they were preaching the Bible but they didn't realize the war that was raging on around them and that the enemy had been encroaching into their territory as a pastor and they found their chest to quote C.S. Lewis but it took like a it took a full frontal attack on their way of life their comfort and how run, they run their their church before they were like, oh gosh, maybe we should do something about that. Hey, listen, I'm not attacking anyone. I'm very grateful that there was an awakening of more bold pastors in 2020. But like, y'all, we should have been that engaged or more like for decades, actually, mm -hmm. right? Um, and, and so now it's a state's battle. So come on, guys, wake up, church. Let's ban abortion in every state. Let's get to the 38 states we need to get a constitutional amendment. We need to ban it. We need to criminalize it. It, it, there's no states' rights argument for abortion, Josh. Just like Stephen Douglas was a racist for suggesting that there was states' rights arguments for slavery. Let's let every state decide. No, no. We need federal protections for the black man. We need federal protections for the unborn child because no person should be de deprived of the right to life without due process of law. That protections for the unborn is already in the Constitution. Unfortunately, Josh, we don't have a culture or a yeah. court system that's going to respect that and apply that amendment to the unborn babies. And so, so the church needs to wake up and stand. And the longer that we tolerate this, by the way, the sooner we'll, we, we will lose the rest of our society. Um, you, you, you remember, um, Josh, this is powerful, the, the good kings of Israel in mm -hmm. first and second kings. This is such a power. The, for, for, for me personally, this is one of the most powerful um, aspects of the Old Testament um, as it pertains to our current cultural moment. I'm not like Andy Stanley, brother. I, I don't like to um, unhitch myself. <laughs> from the Old Testament. I like to hitch myself to the Old Testament. Um, and I, I, there's, I think there's so many aspects of the Old Testament that, that speak with resounding moral and spiritual clarity on kind of the insanity that, that we're seeing unfold before us right now. And so I think of the, the good kings of Israel, and this is how I'm going to answer your question on this front. Um, these were not the evil kings of Israel. OK, there's a list in first and second kings of, of some of the um, good kings of Israel that God labels good kings. There was Asa. Uh, he was a good king who ruled over the kingdom of Judah for 41 years. Um, there was Asa's son Jehoshaphat. He reigned in Jerusalem for 25 years. There was Jehoash. Um, he reigned in Jerusalem for 40 years. There was Amaziah, a good and moral king who reigned in Jerusalem for 29 years. There was Azariah, the son of Amaziah, who reigned 52 years in, Jer in Jerusalem. And there was also Jotham, uh, who was another of the good kings of Judah. He reigned for 16 years in Jerusalem. And guess what the, the same phrase is that God attaches to each of these good kings of Israel. It's the same phrase that God apparently wanted us to know about these kings of Israel. It says, they did what was right in the sight of the Lord. I mean, isn't that beautiful? Like, I, I want that to be said of me. <laughs> Like, mm -hmm. he, he did what was right in the sight of the Lord. Some of them insti insti instituted a number of crucial reforms, Josh, including the removal of male cult prostitutes. Um, uh, so, I mean, some of them uh, really helped shift 
the people of God back. Um, but guess what the final epitaph is? The final line as God wraps up his thoughts on Aza, Jehoshaphat, Jehoash, Amaziah, Azariah, and Jotham. The final line after saying, they did what was right in the sight of the Lord. Woo! But the high places were not taken away. Hmm. Except for the high places were not taken away. That's it. Goodbye. Close the book on those kings. That's all we know about them. That's the final line God wanted the church to know about the good kings of Israel. What are the high places? Uh, yeah, that's right. Temple prostitutes, orgies to worship Astaroth with the Asherah poles. And, um, and um, baby killing to uh, Moloch and Baal. Uh, what are the two pagan gods of American culture today, Josh, if not the same thing? Sex mm -hmm. cults and baby killing and child sacrifice. Ha so you can be a good and moral king, apparently, who even does what is right in the sight of the Lord. But if you fail to deal with the false religion wreaking havoc on families, children, and babies in your midst, and you tolerate such evil, you wash your hands of it, you make peace with it, you will be remembered, according to, to the good kings of Israel, not for your good works, but for the evil that you gave free reign to. So you'll recall, Josh, after years of tolerating, accepting, and participating in sexual idolatry and child sacrifice, Jerusalem is sacked, captured, and pilfered by Nebuchadnezzar and his captain of the guard, Nebuzaradan, who, along with the Chaldeans, utterly destroy the house of the Lord and all of Jerusalem. And so the Babylonian captivity begins. Each of the kings failed to serve their society as prophets, priests, guiding and guarding the land. In other words, it was the silent tolerance of God's good kings that brought event about the eventual destruction of Jerusalem. So the longer we are going to tolerate the Asherah poles and the Baal statues at the state level and make peace with it because we read too many articles at the Gospel Coalition and listen to too many Rick Warren and Tim Keller sermons, the sooner we will find that our tolerance of such evil is what is bringing about the eventual destruction of our country completely in terms of our liberty and freedom to preach the gospel, to raise our children in the admonition of the Lord, to homeschool them, and to raise them to be dragon slayers. We will lose all of that because we tolerated, participated in, or made peace with the same kind of evils that brought about the eventual destruction of Jerusalem. Does that mean that you're just a super winsome pastor who's just trying to make sure you don't offend the Democrats at your church because you really want them to get saved? No, it means that you're a coward. And it means that like the good kings of Israel, while you may be doing some good things, your final epitaph will also be, except the high places were not taken away. That's good. No. Okay. So let's say someone's listening to this. They're all fired up. You're, you do a good job of <laughs> firing people up. Um, what are some practical things that you can do? I mean, maybe you're not a pastor. You can't, you, you know, you're not in charge of what's coming out of the pulpit. What are some on the ground things that Christians who don't want that epithet said of them? What can we do besides voting every four years? So a lot of it depends on the state you live in. Uh, Christian resistance is going to look different now in the state you live in because of the overturning of Roe v. Wade. So red states that have mostly, mostly or totally banned abortion, uh, they don't have brick and mortar abortion centers anymore. Now the abortion pill is still being shipped into those states, by the way, called mm -hmm. RU486, um, which refers to the French pharmaceutical company that created the abortion pill, uh, Roussel Ufla. R R U Russell Ukloff. So that's the abortion pill. Russell Ukloff, by the way, has a majority shareholder named Hookst AG. Um, and in 1916, interestingly enough, Hookst AG co-founded another German chemical company known as IG Farben. And IG Farben years later created a cyanide gas known as Zyklon B, the gas used to poison Jews in Nazi death camps. So Hookst AG simply shifted from creating poison to murder Jews to creating poison to murder babies. It's the same company. So that's wow. where the abortion pill comes from. And that was responsible for 63% of the abortions last year. 63% of mm. the over 1 million babies aborted in America in 2023 was not forceps or suction catheter tubes. It was the medication abortion pill. 630,000 children or more likely had their body parts flushed down the American sewage system as their mothers completed that abortion on the toilet at home in their bathroom. So just so you understand what's going on in the culture, Christian. So you might live in a state where abortion has been mostly banned, and so there's no brick-and-mortar abortion centers, but there's still the abortion pill being shipped illegally against state laws 
two young women's mailboxes and college uh, mail rooms, just so you understand that. So if you live in a state where they have abortion clinics, you need to show up outside of an abortion clinic and you need to graciously plead for the life of the orphan. Um, this is really not that complex, Josh. I believe that if, if we had 100 Christians outside of every abortion center in America, every day they were open, offering the hope of the gospel and the help of the local church, we could bankrupt the abortion industry in a couple of years. And I, I believe that God would remove the curse that we're living under in America because of child sacrifice. Um, these are death camps, guys. Um, why won't Christians just show up outside of abortion centers? I don't understand it. This is so simple. It's legal. It's, it's permissible. You go stand on the sidewalk. Uh, listen, you can go through training. We have partner organizations like Love Life, Operation Save America. We partner with Scott Horde Ministries, who does our sidewalk counseling training. Um, this is very easy. Get trained and go outside of an abortion center and see if God will use you to save a human being's life, which he often does. So we're launching our White Rose Resistance chapters all around the country, Josh. And then we do training for boots on the ground kind of activism. Sometimes that's uh, sidewalk counseling. Sometimes that's speaking at school board meetings. Sometimes that's open prayer and worship events outside of an abortion center. There's a lot of things we need to be doing. Some of you, God might be calling you to run for office, by the way. We need to get godly, spirit-filled men and women on school boards across America, especially in deeper blue cities, counties, and states, to, to kick out the gender theory, um, the opposition to parental rights, and Planned Parenthood's pornographic sex ed out of the schools. We need to protect our children. And if, 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 if parents in America are so wicked that they'll foist that agenda onto their own children, then we as Christians um, need to step up and we need to run for office and we need to get onto those school boards and we need to remove um, groomer school board members who are willing to groom children by encouraging an early exercise of sexuality. Um, that maybe God's calling some of you to do that, by the way. Um, you should be volunteering at your local pregnancy resource center. You should be door knocking for candidates um, who you believe are either uh, Christians or they're not Christians, but they're your best option right now. You know how the political game's played. Uh, and they're conservatives. And you, we need to be participating in the political process to get the right people elected and to work as hard as the left has worked to get their people in positions of political power. Um, how are we going to get rid of the abortion pill in America when it's being shipped illegally? against state laws into red states. We need attorney generals who have a chest who are willing to go after the people sending illegal drugs into their state. This fight has really just begun. The overturning of Roe versus Wade was not the end of the pro-life movement, Josh. It was the beginning of the pro-life movement. Um, and then for simple, simple uh, kind of call to action for you guys right now, uh, go get my book and screen my film uh, at your church. Like This is a super easy educational awakening mobilization tool. So you guys can go to the1916project.com, the1916, that's 1916, the 1916project.com, and press host a screening. The only way to watch the film right now, Josh, is at a church that hosts a screening. We've had, we have like 600 or more churches now who have screened it or are scheduled to, and we're expecting as many as 1,500 by January to have screened it. It comes out online this fall very, very soon. Um, but uh, it's a 75 minute full length documentary and you'll learn about Sanger and her friends uh, cooperation with and relationship with the Nazis, with uh, Hugh Hefner and Playboy magazine, with uh, Alfred Kinsey in the attempt to sexualize children and reduce penalties for sexual criminals. Um, you, you'll learn about um, Planned Parenthood's founding board member who was a, a high official of the Massachusetts KKK. Um, and you'll learn about things you've never heard about or learned about before. Uh, the book has all of the receipts and documentation to prove this. So you can get the book right now at the 1960project.com. You can press host a screening or beg your pastor to host a screening at his church. And then um, if you want to launch a White Rose Resistance chapter in your city, let us know. We do training. We come in with a whole evening of training, then boots on the ground activism. We're, we're packed for this year with planning all of our launches, and we're already scheduling next year launches in cities. So we've launched in Boise, Southern California, Denver. And we're launching in Florida this month, and then we're launching in uh, Fort Worth, Texas next month. Um, and we had 300 people show up to our training at Denver. We had dozens mm -hmm. of believers out on the street saving babies. Um, all of this is then culminating in something we're doing in June of next year that I want you at, Josh. We want everyone listening to this to come out. It's called The Last Stand. Um, because we're in a season, Josh, of the last stand. We all sense it. Maybe it's 18 months. Maybe it's 10 years. I don't know. But it's a season of the last stand. 
uh, we all know that if something doesn't change soon in the culture and in the hearts of Americans, then we could be looking at Bernie Sanders re-education gulags mm -hmm. um, again. I mean, like an actual physical assault on the church and on believers or actually anyone that stands against the cultural zeitgeist, Christian or not. Um, so we believe it's, it's the time to raise up the church for a last stand for life, liberty and the future generation. So in Southern California on June 21st, 2025, we're hosting the last stand with 10,000 people. We've booked Pastor Jack Hibbs, um, Eric Metaxas, Ali Bestucky, Charlie Kirk, uh, uh, John Cooper from Skillet, Danny Gokey. Uh, we're working on getting Tucker right now. Um, and we're going to worship. We're going to pray. We're going to repent. And then we're going to mobilize and launch 100 more White Rose chapters around the country, all to serve the church. So White Rose resistance isn't needed anymore because the church is contending again. So that website's up, guys. If you're interested, it's thelaststand.com, thelaststand.com. And tickets will be available soon. So those are some things that people can do if they want to get engaged in what we're doing or mobilize their churches to do the same. That's great. That's so helpful. Um, White Rose Resistance, that is um, the name of your organization. And that was inspired by a young woman named Sophie Scholl. Um, can you, I know we, we're running out of time, but can you close uh, our time together with, by sharing her story and why she has been so influential to you? Yeah, yeah. I mean, our third child is named Sophie. It's after Sophie Scholl of the White Rose Resistance. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll keep it short, but it's a powerful story. Hans and Sophie Scholl, brother and sister. Um, Sophie was 21, Hans was 24. And they lived in Munich, Germany in 1942. And they were Christians. Um, they were seminary students, university students. They were horrified at what was happening. Um, but Sophie came across a leaflet on a sidewalk in Munich in 1942. And she picked it up and it said, Leaflets of the White Rose. She starts reading this leaflet, Josh, and it's explicitly condemning the crimes of the Nazis and asking good people to wake up. They said things in their leaflets like, if you know, why do you not act? Um, they said, we are the White Rose resistance. We are your bad conscience, and we will not leave you alone. Uh, well, Sophie's heart was stirred to action, Josh. She wanted to join whatever the White Rose resistance was. Well, she's reading this, and she's thinking, this sounds a lot like my brother Hans. Uh, sounds like one of his uh, dinner time rants. Uh, he talks like this a lot. <laughs> Uh, come to find out the White Rose Resistance had not only been co-founded, it was being run by none other than her older brother, Hans, um, a 24-year-old um, who was just trying to protect his little sister. You know, he knew how dangerous political resistance was to the Third Reich in 1942. But Sophie demanded to join the White Rose Resistance, and she became the youngest member and the only female of the White Rose Resistance. They spent the rest of 1942 and early parts of 1943 writing, printing out, and then distributing their anti-Nazi anti leaflets all around Germany. They would take trains in the middle of the night to major German cities, Josh, and do leaflet drops. So it was a social media campaign pre-digital age, okay, guys? So this is how you get out information. This is how you expose the deeds of darkness, Ephesians 5.11. Uh, this is how you raise a standard and get people to engage. Uh, and then in 1943, they took things to the next level. And on February 18th, 1943, Hans and Sophie, brother and sister, walked onto the campus at the University of Munich while class was in session and the halls were quiet. And we filmed there, by the way, in the film. So you'll see it in the movie. And uh, they started distributing their leaflets all around the university. And then in this iconic scene, Sophie walked to the third floor balcony and she threw 100 leaflets three stories down to the atrium below. Of course, when you throw paper, it goes everywhere. Uh, the janitor, a committed Nazi, caught Sophie in the act, called the Gestapo on the spot, and Hans and Sophie were arrested on February 18th, 1943. They spent four days in prison being brutally abused and physically interrogated. I think one of Sophie's interrogations lasted something like eight hours. They refused to rat out any of their other friends or members of the White Rose Resistance, and four days later, they had their heads chopped off. They were put on a guillotine, and they were beheaded for their participation in Christian resistance and trying to get the church to wake up. Because they were killed on February 22nd, 1943, Josh, they missed a meeting they had four days later, which was already arranged, a meeting that they would never make because they had already been dead. That meeting was supposed to have been with a guy named Dietrich Bonhoeffer. 
um, who had come to meet with these 20 something who were also trying to build Christian resistance, just like he was. The prison guards were so disturbed by Hans and Sophie's bravery, Josh, that they relaxed the rules and let Hans and Sophie meet with their parents in a side room right before they were taken to the chopping block. And Sophie's mother looked her doomed daughter in the eyes and said, remember Jesus, Sophie. And Sophie said, yes, but you too, mama. You too, mama. Sophie's final words, according to her cellmate, as Sophie was taken from her cell to the chopping block, was to look out her window. And this 21-year-old said, how can we expect righteousness to prevail when there's hardly anyone willing to give themselves up individually to a righteous cause. Such a fine sunny day, and I have to go now. But what does my death matter if through us, thousands of people are awakened and stirred to action? According to the executioner, Josh, who murdered her, who was later interviewed, Sophie's final words were, the sun still shines. And Hans's final words, like William Wallace, was freedom. <laughs> and over the next nine months, they found the rest of the kids from the White Rose Resistance, and they murdered all of them, too. So listen, while rose blossoms may perish in the fall, they reappear in the spring. And while all of the members of the White Rose Resistance were found and executed, their sacrifices planted the good seeds of resistance in the hearts of millions whose actions will keep alive the legacy of the White Rose Resistance. And your sacrifice, church, will water those seeds of resistance. So one day, maybe, thousands will be awakened and stirred to action. The White Rose will blossom again, and we, like Sophie, can say the sun still shines, spelled S-O-N. Mm -hmm. So we are the White Rose Resistance 2.0, Josh. And if you guys want to get engaged with the White Rose Resistance to rebuild Christian resistance against our culture of death before it's too late, Go to thewhiterose.life or the 1916project.com, thewhiterose.life, and join us as an ally at $35 or $70 a month. You get a battle box in the mail. You join our book club at $70 a month. Um, and you join our, our digital community where we have pro-life courses and curriculum, and I hang out with you live, and we get to hang out and talk. So we, we do a lot to pour into our donors. That's what we're doing, Josh. We're trying to put ourselves out of a job because unless the church flatulent becomes the church militant, it will become the church irrelevant. No, that's a that's yeah a convicting story. I, I hope that uh, her legacy sparks up uh, a movement. And I thank you for what you are you're doing. And uh, it already uh, is. Yeah, yeah. yeah no. Well, I've uh, so enjoyed this time. I could talk all day, but um, yeah, amen. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, thanks for thanks for coming on, Seth. Thank you, Josh. We'll see you again. That's our show for today. Big thanks to Seth Gruber for joining me for this conversation. If you'd like to find out more about his work uh, or to see the documentary, uh, purchase the book, you can head over to the 1916project.com. That is 1916, not 1619, a very different project. Um, but yeah, head over there. You'll have all the information you need to uh, connect with Seth and the work he's doing. If you found this episode helpful, please like and subscribe so you don't miss future episodes. Go ahead and share it with a friend. And if you're listening on um, podcast ratings and reviews over at Apple Podcasts are always appreciated. Till next time, I will talk to you soon.